Let's read God's Word in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Anisiphorus, for he oft refreshed me, and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, He sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus thou knowest very well. Amen. Second Timothy 1 verses 1 through 5 is our text or more precisely Parts of these verses constitute our text, and other parts of it two weeks ago, and other parts of it tonight. Let's read the whole of the first five verses of 2 Timothy 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, Peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. 
Beloved, in our earlier treatment of 2 Timothy 1 verse 1, we covered just two of the three main parts. Paul, we noted, is first an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he is that second by the will of God. We didn't get to the third bit of that first verse, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. What's the idea here with this last part of the first verse? It's this. Crucial as is Paul's apostolic office in God's sovereign plan and good pleasure. We had a sermon laying out some of the main features of that two weeks ago. Crucial as that is, and it's a lot more crucial than any of us understood, I trust, before that sermon, the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus is far higher than it in the sovereign purpose of the triune God and subservient to his glory, that that promise of life in Christ Jesus is the number one thing in God's eternal plan. In Paul's apostolic office, and all that it embraces and all that it means, must and does conform to the higher purpose, and it must and does serve the higher purpose, the great promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Now that phrase, the promise of life in Christ Jesus, well that was given way back in the very beginning in Genesis 3 verse 15. The seed of the woman, that's the promise, the seed of the woman is going to come and crush the serpent, that is Satan's head, through the serpent crushing the seed of the woman's heel. That refers to Jesus Christ, centrally the seed of the woman, and his cross, where Satan had his head crushed, that is, he was defeated, that evil snake, and Christ was bruised and crushed in the performance of that great calling. This was the promise. And this was a promise of life, Because it was God's response to man's death which was threatened in the day that thou eatest of the forbidden fruit, thou shalt surely die. Spiritual death in the form of total depravity came to the whole human race which issued in physical death, though it took Adam 930 years to expire, which would have issued in eternal death in hell. So that the life and the promise of the life comes through the seed of the woman, a promise of eternal, spiritual, heavenly life. And this was God's promise of life, as our text says, in Christ Jesus, the anointed one. He's the seed of the woman. That's what Christ means. Anointed as a prophet and a priest and a king. Basic building blocks of the Christian faith. And he is Jesus, which means Jehovah salvation, so that life is going to be promised and received through the coming Savior, who is the mighty Jehovah, that anointed man filled with the Holy Spirit, his life and work. Paul is saying here that this is the message, that this is the hope in Genesis way back in Genesis 3, all the way forward to the rest of the Pentateuch and embracing the truth of Old Testament history and Old Testament prophecy, that is, the whole of Old Testament revelation. And the point is, in this first verse, Paul's apostolic office and work is in keeping with and subservient to The promise of life in Christ Jesus given at the very beginning and being fulfilled in the cross and embracing all the people of God up until and beyond the second coming of our Savior. Paul's apostolic call and commission, his apostolic preaching and miracles, it's all in conformity with and it's all subservient to 
is the number one thing God's promise of life to his people in Jesus Christ. And you may remember, and I hope that you do, the greatness of the church office of apostle. We said that it is the highest in the church under Jesus Christ himself, none higher. It's above, obviously, the office of deacon or elder or minister, the permanent, temporary offices in the church. That it's above the miraculous, extraordinary and temporary offices of prophet and evangelist. That this highest of all church offices, the very most inclusive of all offices, because apostle embraces in it, essentially, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, elder, deacon. And we saw that this inclusive office, embracing all the rest, highest office over all the rest, is universal. So that if you are an apostle, you don't just exercise your office in a particular congregation, and where appropriate in certain occasions and times within a denomination or within a region but the apostolic office was over all the churches and now within this high even highest inclusive universal office of apostle it is fair to say that Paul's apostleship was the greatest he was the apostle to the Gentiles because the promise of life must come to them, not only to the Jews. That the apostle Paul, he tells us this humbly in 1 Corinthians 15, labored more abundantly than the other apostles because he had to preach the promise of life in Christ Jesus to them. And that Paul was a wise master builder probably the wisest master, master builder of all the apostles in the churches, 1 Corinthians 3 says this, so that there would be congregations holding fast to the number one thing, the promise of life in Christ Jesus. This is what Paul is teaching in concise fashion in this opening verse. Here's his office, apostolic office. Herculean labors. It's all according to God's eternal will or decree. It's a prominent point in God's all embracing purpose for the universe. Paul, his work, his position, his labors, in keeping with God's good pleasure, as delightful and well pleasing to him as it is. Yet the number one thing isn't Paul, the number one thing is Jesus Christ. The Son of God crucified for our sins, bringing the promise of life. And Paul's labors, important as they are, they must conform with that, and they must be, and they are subservient to that. So here's the Apostle Paul in this first verse. He knows his office, his role and calling in life. He knows that it is exalted, that there is actually none greater under Christ in the church but he also knows his own place that he is way under Jesus Christ and that he is way under the gospel message that he brings he's an earthen vessel bringing a message of glory that he's a servant servant of Jesus Christ and the good news and if that's the case with the apostle Paul and his position in the eternal purpose of God, probably the most important figure under Christ in the last 2,000 years, what does that say for the rest of us? The great issue is the promise of life in Jesus Christ. And what we are this morning is tiny, tiny little cogs subservient to that big purpose. That's all that we are. It's great to be that, but we often think we're something when we're nothing. Just little cause. Very little. 
And in that this is called, in our text, the promise of life in the Messiah, Jehovah salvation, promise, God says, I pledge this, and I hold it forth. I held it forth in the Garden of Eden after the very first sin. I held it forth right through the Old Testament, in the preaching of John the Baptist and Jesus and in Paul's day and in ours. And so this whole life comes to us in the form of a promise. What do you do with a promise? You believe it. Every time the Bible says promise, you know faith. Faith deals with the promise. The promise isn't law. Though there are promises contained in the book of the law. The promise isn't about works or earning. The correlative of promise is faith. Here's a promise. I embrace the promise. And faith believes and faith receives. And everyone who comes to the promise in faith says, I have life in Jesus Christ. Eternal life. It's the promise of life in the Messiah. And the calling that comes to us in 2 Timothy, that chapter above any others is, you hold fast to the promise. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. It says verse 14. Now you understand that this book, 2 Timothy, is one of Paul's three canonical pastoral epistles written to an evangelist, Timothy. The nearest thing we have to that today is a pastor teacher in the church. And he's saying, there's this promise of life that's in Christ Jesus and you, Timothy, you must preach it insofar as this is your place in God's eternal counsel and will. You preach it. This is what your life and ministry is all about. You proclaim it and hold it forth so that others will hold it fast. Which brings us to our theme for this morning, Paul's relationship to Timothy. Paul's relationship to Timothy. And I'm going to look now at features of this in verses 2, 3, 4, and 5, parts of those verses, if not all of each one of them. That this relationship of Paul to Timothy is summed up under our three points. His beloved son, that's the relationship, his spiritual benediction, and his fond remembrances. Paul's relationship to Timothy, a beloved son, a spiritual benediction, and then fond remembrances. You immediately understand that when Paul calls Timothy his dearly beloved son, he does in verse 2 he's not claiming to be Timothy's physical or even adoptive father Paul was single he never married and he never had any physical children and Timothy his earthly physical father is called in Acts 16 verse 1 a Greek whereas Paul was a Jew in 1 Timothy 1 verse 2, Paul calls Timothy my own son in the faith. It's a spiritual sonship. But I dare say you already knew that. But I just want to spell it out so that everybody's clear. Now in that Timothy was Paul's dearly beloved son. One might ask, does that mean that Timothy was born again? under the apostles' ministry. That is what happened to Onesimus, as we read in Philemon 10. I beseech thee, Philemon, for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. That is, while Paul was in prison, his first captivity in Rome, he preached to Onesimus, who was born again under his ministry, so that Onesimus became Paul's spiritual son. But I don't believe that's the case with Timothy. 
I believe that Timothy was already a believer before Paul met him. 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 and 15 read as follows. Paul tells Timothy, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus from a child, he had the Holy Scriptures brought to him by his mother and grandmother, and he learned and was assured of these things by faith and from a child. And we'll say more about some of this in the evening, Lord willing. I believe that Timothy was probably Paul's <coughs> spiritual son in part, because Paul was the one through whom Timothy heard that the Messiah had come. You see, Timothy already believed, as was the case with many in this intermediate age recorded in the New Testament Scriptures, Timothy already believed the Old Testament. He was saved through believing in the Messiah who was to come, like Eunice and like Lois. That it was salvation by faith in the coming Messiah. There was a promise of life in him. So he was already in fellowship with God through a living faith. And then Paul came to Lystra in the middle of Turkey thereabouts, which was Timothy's hometown. Paul preached twice in Lystra. In Paul's first missionary journey, it's recorded in Acts 14. Timothy may well have heard of then. And that when Paul went back there in the second missionary journey at the start of Acts 16, it becomes more and more clear to Timothy that this is the one whom Paul is preaching. This is the Jesus who fulfills the Old Testament prophecy. I've been looking for the one who is going to come as my parents, as my mother and grandmother taught me. And now it really is him. Jesus of Nazareth is the one spoken of by the Old Testament prophets. He's been born of a virgin. He's lived sinlessly. He's died on the cross. He's risen again, reigning over the universe. Fulfillment is in him. I look to him as God's messenger and my savior. Now if Timothy was probably, and for me it's almost certainty, brought by Paul to the knowledge that Jesus of Nazareth is the one whom he had been looking for all these years, and that that's key in the idea of Timothy as Paul's son, then I'll be even more certain that it is absolutely definite that when Paul calls him here, my dearly beloved son, he certainly means this, that you're my son in the sense that I'm an older man and I'm your spiritual father who has trained you in your calling in the church over many years. Paul was the one in Acts 16 who decided to bring Timothy with him and Silas on his second missionary journey. This was a sort of apprenticeship in order to teach Timothy the ropes. And Paul chose Timothy because he thought highly of Timothy, even though he was a relatively young man, and he thought highly of him, and so did the church in Derby and Lystra. And then these two men, Paul and Timothy, worked together over many years. They had the same spirit in their work, side by side. And they were like-minded in everything that they did. Paul teaches us this in Philippians 2, verse 19 and following. He says to the church at Philippi, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. That is, I'm going to send Timothy, he'll come back to me and he'll tell me how you're getting on. And I'm sending Timothy, he says, for I have no man like-minded. He and I see things exactly the same. 
we are like-minded. I have nobody as like-minded with me as Timothy. He will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own. That is, they have the wrong motives. Many of them in the early church even. But they're not seeking the things which are Christ Jesus. And then he adds, and this is the clincher on why I quote this text, but you know the proof of him. That is, you know his proven character. That as a son with the father, he hath served with me in the gospel. And here we're to think of fathers training their children in guilds and on farms for centuries where the son learns, picks up the trade from everything that his father does. That's the way Paul and Timothy were. As a son with the father, he has served with me in the gospel. Paul refers to this special bond he has with Timothy elsewhere. Here's another striking passage. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17. For this cause have I sent unto you Timothy. You see, he sent Timothy to the church of Philippi. He sent Timothy to the church at Corinth. Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. He'll tell you exactly the same message I will. He's my beloved son. We serve together. And so Paul's closeness and love for his spiritual son, Timothy, a closeness and love probably greater than any other figure in the New Testament church for Paul, comes out in many ways to of the three pastoral epistles written to Timothy, one to Titus, none to anybody else. Paul did many journeys throughout Europe and the Middle East with Timothy. Paul makes more references to Timothy in the book of Acts and in his epistles than anybody else. And Timothy, for Paul, was his most trusty lieutenant. So he left Timothy in Ephesus to see that that key church was developed, brought further forward because he'd no one better to delegate the work to. Timothy. And this, beloved, is a beautiful thing, this fellowship between Paul and Timothy. In Old Testament terms, maybe it's the closest to David and Jonathan. There's love and trust between Paul and Timothy. That's the way it should be between all the men in church office. So they're all working together, like-minded in the Lord, in his work, in the congregation. This comes through everyone having the same goal, the glory of God, through spreading the truth and the upbuilding of the church. And with that true goal, isn't there? All sorts of other inferior sinful goals come in and crowd it out and spoil things. So uh, the office bearers in the church and the members of the church, because we all work together, serve together side by side in humility and truth by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we need in the church. The sort of relationships that are spoken of in Scripture and here particularly between Paul and Timothy my dearly beloved son. And then Paul says, Grace, mercy, and peace to you, Timothy. And in so saying, with that word grace, Paul tells Timothy that God has a favorable attitude towards you in Jesus Christ. And I'm praying, Paul says to Timothy, that this divine attitude towards you of favor will issue in a powerful operation towards you and in you, making you, in turn, more beautiful and lovely with the pleasantness of spiritual <laughs> holiness in Christ Jesus. Grace to you. Mercy. Because Timothy, Almighty God desires and wills your blessedness. And I'm praying here 
and conferring this benediction by the grace of God, so that he may powerfully lift you more and more out of your sin and misery and crown you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Grace, mercy, and peace. So you're not at war with God, walking stubbornly in your sin, kicking against the pricks, but that your life in the kingdom of heaven is characterized by wholeness, blessedness, completeness, and spiritual prosperity in Christ Jesus. That's a good thing to be praying. That's a worthy benediction. And what about the source of this blessing and its mediator? The source of these things, grace, mercy, and peace, that's the triune God, who is our Father for Jesus Christ's sake, the one who regenerated us and the one who cares and provides for us. And the mediator, that is, this comes from God, through the mediator, is our Lord Jesus Christ, fully God fully man and therefore betwixt God and man as the one who unites deity and humanity in himself. He mediates God's grace, mercy and peace to us. He brings it to us and puts it in us by the Holy Spirit on the basis of his atonement and by his intercession at the right hand of God. So that Paul's benediction could be paraphrased thus. May the triune God powerfully favor and deeply enrich you with blessedness and peace through the mediation of Jesus Christ. And we might add, may he do that by the operations of the Holy Spirit. Because that's how God acts through Jesus Christ. It's always by the Spirit, the Spirit of the Son and the Father. Not mentioned here, but for the sake of completeness, I mention it so we all have that straight. And even this apostolic benediction here shows us why God's grace is only and ever particular, that is, for the elect alone. This benediction excludes the erroneous notion that, that God has a grace which is common or universal. This passage is teaching, when it's rightly unpacked, that wherever God has an attitude of grace or mercy, wherever God has that attitude or disposition towards someone, there's always an accompanying power of that grace or mercy. Because he's God. He doesn't have an attitude or a disposition whereby he wants to do good things to somebody, but he doesn't actually do them. That's contrary to the divine omnipotence. To go further, God's grace and mercy always result in peace. Spiritual and eternal peace. God doesn't have grace and mercy towards some people, but there's no peace for them. The blessing of God is grace, mercy, and peace. So that person is at peace with God. God's grace and mercy never have and never will result in this, that there's a single person for whom God has grace or mercy, but that person is not at peace with God. And that person ends up in hell under God's everlasting burning fury. Grace, mercy, and the third thing, peace. You have one, and you have them all. You don't have one of them or two of them without the third thing. And you'll notice as well here, God's grace, mercy, and therefore also peace, only come through Jesus Christ. And when these things are said to be coming through Jesus Christ, the anointed one as prophet, priest, and king, Jehovah's salvation, it means only through his mediation only through the blood of his cross, only through his prayers and intercession, which means God's grace and God's mercy and God's peace are always particular for those for whom Jesus Christ died 
and those for whom he intercedes and prays. Because he says, I pray not for the world, I pray for those whom thou hast given me, for they are thine. John 17, verse 9. Two more things about Paul's benediction here. It's authoritative. He's praying grace, mercy, and peace upon Timothy by virtue of his apostolic <coughs> office as the representative and a very high, lofty, though humble representative of God too, a representative of Christ. And secondly, this benediction is usual at the start of Paul's letters. They begin as here, Paul, we would say from Paul, to, in this instance, Timothy, and then we have usually, though not always, a benediction. And the benediction always comes in all three of the pastoral epistles, first and second Timothy and Titus. But in that Paul utters this benediction in his apostolic office, and that he usually does it, we're not to think, though, that this benediction is merely formal. Well, I'm an apostle, and God has told me when I write a letter that I have to put a benediction in verse 2, as it were. Paul tells us that this isn't just a matter of form, that it's heartfelt. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, his bowels are moving for this man. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And this gives us something to guard against at the very start of the service and especially at the very end of the service. For the minister to guard against the grace, mercy, and peace with outstretched arms so that they're not just words and that I don't think that it's just something that I do and that it comes therefore without the feeling of the dearly beloved. And you, and especially your children, mustn't think that the benediction at the end of a service is like, well, it's not over to the fat lady sings. It's not over to the minister puts out his hands. That's like the amen of a prayer. Also the wrong way to think of an amen of the prayer. When the minister does that, that means, where do I put my hymn book? Where are my car keys? Right, am I going to get out of the left side of the pew or the right side of the pew? It's time to leave. No. But God in heaven, through a representative, the minister is blessing us. At the end of this service, it'll come in due time, don't worry. Though it tarry, it'll come. And at the end of each service, the triune God powerfully blessing us, not without faith, but through faith, and the more as we appropriate that and believe that God is gracious. He's giving us mercy and peace. You remember now, this is a pastoral epistle. Paul's writing this to Timothy. He's doing this because he believes that Timothy, a fine, like-minded Christian and gospel worker that he is, needs this blessing. He needs it personally, and he needs it in his difficult labors in Ephesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father through Jesus Christ, and you need it, and you need it for your work, as all of us need it. Which brings us to our third and final point, because... 2 Timothy 1 verses 3 through 5 mentions three of Paul's fond remembrances of Timothy. And there's a fond remembrance of Timothy in each of those three verses. One in verse 3, one in verse 4, and one in verse 5. Here's the first one. Paul fondly remembered Timothy in his prayers. In all his prayers. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience. I'll say more about that this evening, Lord willing. That without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. 
Paul tells us that he prays day and night. Now, obviously, he sleeps, but at night and when he's not sleeping, and when he's praying, and through the day, he's letting his hearts, petitions, and desires, letting them be known to God. And that's the way we should pray. We pray night and day, or day and night. And the apostle is an example to us. Something to do when you can't sleep at night. Pray. And Paul here tells Timothy that Timothy was included in all or practically all of these prayers of Paul night and day. I'm praying for you and I'm praying for you night and day, he says. And you think to yourself, that's very faithful, isn't it? I don't know if I pray for anybody night and day. Maybe my wife. Maybe the church in general. Wow, night and day. That's a lot of love too. He's on Paul's heart. When he wakes up at night and before he goes to bed, he's praying for, for Timothy. I don't think we should infer from this that Paul prayed night and day without ceasing for every Christian that he knew. Because Paul knew an awful lot of Christians, way more than you or I know. And if he did that, then he never could pray, never could finish praying at all. He wouldn't get anything else done. But I think when this passage says that Paul prayed for Timothy night and day continually, this is an indication of a special love that Paul has for him as his dearly beloved son with whom he had traveled throughout much of the Mediterranean world for years, working alongside him and being animated by the same spirit. But this certainly teaches that we should be engaged more in intercession for other people and not only ourselves. And that we should do it because we view those for whom we pray as dearly beloved in Jesus Christ. Paul remembered Timothy in his prayers. And Paul also remembered Timothy's tears. That's verse 4. Greatly desiring to see thee being mindful or remembering thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. This reminds me of my early days as a Christian in the Methodist church. I remember moving in those circles. I was a very young Christian, so I asked for your indulgence. And Paul was forever being criticized. That Paul was a very nasty, bigoted man. Not popular. He had it in for women. We're going back now to like the 90s. Had it in for women. Because they were big into women preachers. And he was very bigoted. And he, he didn't have the wonderful modern spirit that we have in the, in the 20th and 21st century. Poor Paul. It's a real, real shame for him that he wasn't up with the times. And he was far too doctrinal. He was far too clear and sharp and he criticised false doctrines. Why? Because the, one, the, the church is filled with women ministers and nobody gave a hoot about doctrine. And I thought, boy, you know, I read the Bible and I think Paul's a, Paul's a really, is that right? They're saying this about this, this apostle. I was troubled by this. I should have been more than troubled, of course. And then I was reading the book of Acts at the end of Acts chapter 20, Paul's meeting with the elders at Ephesus in Miletus, all of the elders, of course, being men, which wouldn't have went down well with the Methodists. And then we read, when Paul had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him onto the ship. I thought, boy, all these Methodists can't stand Paul. He seems to be a bigot. But in Acts 20, they're praying with him. They're weeping sore on his neck. They're kissing him because their hearts are broken that they may never see him again. And then they accompanied him to the ship so that they could spend every last second with him before he left. And I thought, you know what? These, these Ephesians and Miletians, they have it right. The Methodists have it wrong. Tears. It was a sign of the love they had for him. 
Now here, in 2 Timothy 1 verse 4, something like this evidently happened on the last occasion when Paul had seen Timothy. When they departed from each other, Timothy wept. And he's a man too. He wept. I mightn't see Paul again, or I mightn't see him for a long time. I'm so close to him. He's my spiritual father. He wept for him. And now here's Paul remembering Timothy in his prayers and remembering the last time they spent together when Timothy shed tears of love and sadness at their departure. And Paul wants to see Timothy. He wants to see him in person in that Roman prison before his martyrdom one last time in this life. And he wants the filling of joy in seeing Timothy again. Because prison, even though Paul was a remarkable man, prison wasn't pleasant for him. And Paul also as a human being naturally shrank from death. Greatly desiring to see thee being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. Paul's fond remembrance of Timothy in prayer and remembering his tears. And finally, thirdly, Paul fondly remembered Timothy's sincere faith. I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in me. I remember you, Timothy, as a believer. Not a hypocritical believer who wears a mask and tells people, I believe all this, it's really crucial and important to me, but it doesn't really weigh with the person. Paul says, Timothy, you believe truly, firmly, from the heart. You're a genuine believer because you've been born again by the Holy Spirit, because you were redeemed in the blood of Jesus Christ, because you were elect by the Father. Paul's fond remembrance of a beloved son, probably the closest, most beloved son spiritually he had. His sincere faith, his tears of love, mentioning him continually in his prayers. And that, of course, beloved, is the way we should remember our fellow saints. And we immediately feel insufficient. We immediately feel we don't. But let's strive to do that better by the grace of God. This is the way we should remember our fellow saints. Though doubtless they're not as spiritual as Timothy and we're not as spiritual as Paul. We should remember our fellow saints this way and we should live this way so as to be remembered at least a bit more in this way by our own fellow saints. Some tears at the parting perhaps. Some more love. Some more praying night and day. That's what this scripture calls us to. Amen. Our Father in heaven, bless to us this word that we may see this beautiful example of friendship in the early church and that thou may use it to encourage us to love and faithfulness and devotion. Forgive graciously our sins and care for us in our sins and weakness today. In Jesus' name, amen.